everyone. Welcome back to Rewildology, where we explore conservation, travel, sustainability, and leave it all out on the table. In this episode, I am chatting with Court Whalen, PhD, who is an entomologist and ecotourism expert. We chat about his interesting path into finding his way into entomology and photography guiding, why he chose a career over entrepreneurship, and the importance of tourism for wildlife conservation. This one sure is a goodie, and I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. So now, on to the show. All right, well, thanks, Court, for coming on. I'm so excited to have you on Rewildology today. <laughs> so to start, you, there are so many titles and labels that you can easily call yourself with your phenomenal resume that you have, but you're first and foremost an entomologist. What gave you your love of bugs? Where did that come from? Yeah, the bug, the bug guy. Um, yeah, it's a great question. It's a great starter question because it's like nothing. <laughs> like, and there's not, there's no like. Well, actually, there was a very specific moment, but it's like it's not, it's not anything like you'd think. You know, a lot of a lot of people that are in entomology, you know, they had like bug collections as a kid, and they're just, you know, they had parents that were entomologists, or they like, you know, named their first bug when they were ten, or some like some weird stuff like that. No, I just was an undecided major taking oceanography and philosophy and business and all random stuff um, and, and a bug class to, you know, get my biology credit. Um, and then they kind of, they make you choose a major uh, at the end of your first year. And I was like, well, this is the most interesting class that I'm in. You know, I was learning about how honeybees communicate and about how termites form, you know, social colonies and all that. And I, I was like, if there's anything I have to learn a lot more of, I, I, let's just have it be this. And I, you know, I had no idea, like, what kind of career am I going to get with bugs? And I just didn't worry about it because I knew that I could change my major a million times if I needed to. I just had to have something. And it stuck. Like, as I learned more and more about this stuff, about the physiology, about, the, about how the rest of the species communicate, the diversity, the types of adaptations they have, um, what I quickly realized is that, like, when you start to learn about bugs and you get really in depth, where where they're at in like the trophic pyramid is everything either eats or is eaten by insects and so you get this really interesting view this lens where you you just learn all of biology through entomology um because you're you're taking classes on soils and you're taking classes on mimology and you're taking classes on plant physiology and you're taking you know and, and of course all your insect phys physiology stuff and this goes you know from bachelor's you know through phd like you you learn all that stuff um, and you just, yeah, it's so, I mean, I, I love insects because I've learned about them, but there wasn't, it wasn't like the other way around. I just happened to stumble upon it and I was like, man, this is the craziest stuff. I should, this is fun to learn. Um, and then just snowballed in this like ecotourism thing. My like, God, oh, this is, this is too good. This is awesome. Love it. <laughs> so yeah, that's kind of the weird wacky answer on that one. No, that's good. So then what were you like as a child? Uh, not weird at all. No, uh, I don't know. I was, I'm sure. Yeah. When I say I wasn't the weird bug kid, I was, I wasn't the weird bug. Kid. I'm sure I was weird. Um, as a child, geez, OPs. I was into nature. I love nature. Um, I grew up in Florida, um, which has a lot of nature, of course, but not, you know, certainly not nature. Like you'd think, um, you know, out West in the Rockies or in the Smoky mountains or in tropical countries. I mean, it was, uh, it was a lot of, uh, ocean nature, a lot of beach stuff, a lot of, um, inland palmetto, forests and pine forests and that sort of stuff but yeah it was always i mean if there's one thing that i could say i was probably a um uh like one thing that identified me I, I i studied a lot like i was always in school i was always doing homework i was like i was always in you know the more kind of like difficult schools and all that and so i i just i don't want to say i was like a nerd but probably by like outside standards like i just i, I had to study a lot and so yeah, that's the funny thing. You, know, you when people look at me as like this expedition leader and traveling all around the world all the time and doing all sorts of fun, cool stuff. It's like I it wasn't because I grew up in a traveling family and you know went on safaris. It, it was very much the opposite. Like I didn't have much of that at all. And then I kind of threw a lot of studying and getting into like you know good school programs and and fortunately like getting you know like scholarships and stuff where i i, I didn't have to uh, teach or didn't have to research or didn't have to you know work eight part-time jobs um i i got to experiment with with stuff and the big 
aha moment was um, when I was sort of in my early days of entomology at, at the university and got to go on this internship over spring break and was down in Belize uh, and kind of paid my way on that. Um, through you know scholarship money and that sort of thing, and it was like aha, this this is totally what I want to do. Now that's not the question you asked necessarily, but you know as a kid, like, yeah, I was oh, okay. Well, yeah. So in, in short, to answer your question directly, I was just like a a, a very like academic like school based kid. I, I did some extracurriculars, but I was definitely never like the football player. I played some tennis. I I liked to surf a lot when I was a kid. So I you know was at the beach and did all that stuff. Um, Grew up playing violin. I mean, these are all details you probably don't want to know, but um, I didn't know that. yeah, Come on, oh yeah, dude. I, yeah, you played, played violin. Yeah, I played probably played violin since I was three. I mean, I don't play it anymore, but yeah, I was like, I was definitely that kid. Uh, <laughs> played a lot of violin. Yeah, so, but that's that trans. I know we're going in all sorts of tangents, but yeah, so that translated to um, string instruments. So I played through high school, um, so whatever that is, like fifteen years. And then in college, I was like, oh, yeah, guitar is great. So guitar and then that transition of banjo and all that fun stuff. But I just dabble these days. Anyway, your question. of Yeah, so that's that's my kid. Oh, yeah. So Belize. Yeah. So this is like this is what you really want to hear about is like what kind of set me on my big time course. So, yeah, I was I was in academics and I studied a lot. And so I you know got good grades and blah, blah, blah. But the big thing was I went on this internship to Belize. Um, I was taking entomology classes um i thought tropical entomology was cool because like the bigger the better you know like the bigger badder more colorful bugs of course more interesting right so um paid my way on an internship went to belize um it was uh, two weeks with this like very very small tour company but the way it overlapped with my spring break it was like after my spring break so i'm like well gotta go down to belize for spring break get my feet wet like like figure the whole thing out right so i went down there i was i was super green um, like, like novice green, you know, I had this backpack on, I thought I was like, you know, this cool backpacker traveler with like pots and pans and like just packages of like craft macaroni and cheese. Like, it was just like the silliest thing. Um, I think it was like an 80 pound backpack I and mean, it was ridiculous. <laughs> ridiculous. And, I'm, and I just, and I just, I just like took the bull by the horns and like, I got, you know, like the, the country bus and got them to drop me off the entrance of like the jungle and I just like hoofed it in and I just, I had these like coordinates or not really coordinates, but, like these instructions for where this, this field camp was in the middle of Coxcomb base and Jaguar reserve. Um, and I just camped in the jungle for like a week. It was, there were like barracks, you know, like bunk beds and all that, but I had my sleeping bag and I had all my food and they had like a little propane kitchen, you know, where you could boil stuff. So, but it was so funny, you know, I'm there and uh, there's like summer camps and, and the, the kids are, like getting you know catered food from the Mayan village, and they're eating like these awesome meals, and I'm like sitting there, I have no idea that this is a possibility. I'm just eating my you know mac and cheese and rice, rice and beans and like summer sausage, and you know somehow roughing it slash you know earning my stripes in the jungle. But I think you know the big moment came as I'm like there for like a week, which actually sounds like a, it felt like a very long time because there's nothing to do. And it was that moment where you realize that like the only thing to do is to like look at nature and study nature and like spend hours looking at the leaf cutter ants, you know, going across the trail and like really studying, like looking at them and making notes and just, just appreciating that. And I, throughout the course of the trip, so then I met up with this group of high school kids that I was supposed to be, you know, guiding as part of this, this tour, this internship and um, reflecting back on that week in the jungle and all the you know, arduousness to get there and the, the trial and error and just the funny, silly memories, but then guiding this group and teaching kids about everything I've learned, um, you know, from college, from high school, from all this stuff. It was like, that was my big aha moment that, oh man, like I want to be teaching people about nature out in nature at this very like field trip pace. Um, and so I came back and uh talked to the chairman of my entomology department i'm like okay so i've got this idea and this is back when like ecotourism was eh, barely like a household word i mean it was kind of but nothing like you know what was to come and so i told him i had this idea i really liked entomology i want to go to grad school et cetera, et cetera. and he's like huh that's interesting well i kind of i kind of been thinking about this idea of ecotourism too but we have no faculty we have no staff we have no textbooks we have nothing like that but you know if you want to try to 
try to do it, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll put you up. We'll, we'll like figure out how to make it work. You got to, you know, go to the president's office and get a scholarship or a fellowship, whatever. But then through just iteration, steady by steady, I've pieced everything together. Um, and that's essentially how I got on track to study and be in ecotourism entomology. Um, so it did like, it all started with bugs, a lot of serendipity, a lot of right time, right place, a lot of luck. Um, but that's kind of how childhood got me to where I am. That was a very convoluted answer to your question, but <laughs> no, that was great. That was great. You ended exactly where I hoped you would. So, <laughs> so I would love if you would just take a second, cause I know more about what you study. So could you talk about your, your undergrad and then, um, also more about what you studied for your PhD? Cause I think that those mm -hmm. are very foundational for what you ended up doing later in your career. So mm -hmm. if you want to talk a little bit more about those, what was the project sure. that you and your advisors or the head of entomology department came up with and how did they come to be? Cool. Yeah, yeah, certainly. So, you know, when I was undergrad and this is like towards my senior year. So I ended up graduating, which is, you know, entomology and then master's and PhD was, was in this idea of ecotourism entomology. So, you know, not ever having done, it, it's like, oh, well, how do we combine like this basic science of entomology with, and that's like, you know, a quote unquote hard science with the more sociological science um, of ecotourism because the discipline sort of existed, um, but it was a lot of sociological studies. It's like a tourism department would be, you know, your, your studies are, are like surveys of people going to state parks. Like, did you like it? Like, how much would you be willing to pay to enter this place if you had to pay? And like, that's how you measure, you know, visitor satisfaction and economics and all that sort of stuff. Um, so how to, how to mix the two. Um, and so we ended up, uh, I, for my master's, um, I studied the effects of butterfly farming on uh, habitats uh, in Florida and Costa Rica, kind of like using a comparative sort of study. And so the idea is you have, for those that don't know, um, butterfly farms are all around the world in a lot of tropical areas. And what they do is they basically raise butterflies to then send and sell to like butterfly, uh, like vivariums, like exhibits. So when you go to um, like certain museums or certain zoos or certain like like Disney World has like big butterfly houses and they're all live butterflies flying and they're in this tropical rainforest, um, these ha have to be produced somewhere. And most of them are produced in countries like Costa Rica and Brazil and the Philippines and Papua New Guinea and Solomon Islands and Madagascar and Kenya. And um, the question is, is these are great, cool. But do they have an effect on the environment, like like a positive or negative? Like, do they do anything? And so the study was just to figure out, like, okay, well, do they do they like attract butterflies from the forest? Um, and I won't go into the details, but you put out these transects of you know butterfly host plants. And basically, the the long story short is that we we tried to figure out would the butterflies come in from the surrounding forest, lay eggs on all the host plants that are around the butterfly um, breeding areas but then act as like a sink for parasites and parasitoids and predators of the environment because they know that they're there. They're like, you know, sitting ducks. Um, long story short, did, didn't really uh, have a negative impact, but did have an impact. We found that butterflies did lay eggs from the environment a lot closer to the butterfly farms. Um, so that was like just a classic sort of like Lepidoptera study. There, the ecotourism component was just where we were at. It wasn't like the sociological ramifications. Um, but then for my PhD, you know, I obviously got to level up a bit. And so it was a pretty in-depth, uh, set of studies and uh, gosh, what was the title? I think it was experiments with entomological ecotourism models and the effects of ecotourism on the monarch butterfly. And so the gist is, yeah, I know, uh, it's a mouthful. And so there was kind of like two components to it. There was, um, the classic hard science of, um, studying effects of ecotourism on an insect species and it, you know I'll, i can fill you in more if you want to know on like the effects of ecotourism on the monarch butterflies in short not bad <laughs> fine things are okay um but uh the other part was basically experimenting with like what is this concept of entomological ecotourism like what role do insects fill in the ecotour model like how can you involve insects into ecotourism so obviously one of the quick ones low-hanging fruit is monarch butterfly migration so that that's a great one 
Um, the other, uh, we studied, and this is all through like case studies. And I, I actually like ran a tour company and did a bunch of tours and led all that stuff and got all the metrics on like, you know, willingness to pay or actual amounts paid and, you know, how many people would come down and then how do they compare in terms of popularity and visitation? Um, so we also like paired butterfly watching with bird watching tours. And we found that like you could actually take a bird watching tour and convert them into butterfly watchers um, because of like the similarities. Uh, and then we did a third type that was more like a research based where we would do all the work and, you know, renting out the research station, getting the permits and getting researchers from all around the country or all around the world to go do research, um, but not have to worry about all the mumbo jumbo, like how to get there and how to, how to find their research subjects, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so that was basically just like a big case study of running ecotourism entomology programs. Um, but then of course, you know, with that, I ran normal programs too, like Kenya safaris and Madagascar trips and Galapagos. So the cool thing, and this is where it's just fun to do it, is over the course of, what, seven years of a master's and PhD, um, you know, I got those degrees, I did all the research, figured out how academia works. So much of grad school is just like learning how to figure out how things work. Like not <laughs> the science, but like, how do you get your dissertation edited and formatted? Like, who do you need to see? It's just like working the politics of it. But then also I got to run this travel company um, that, uh, you know, I got to guide on all seven continents, uh, you know, within my grad school days, led 60 or 70 expeditions, got a couple degrees out of it and set me on this track to be kind of like an ecotourism specialist and expedition leader. It was pretty good. <laughs> so how did you balance guiding that many trips as well as getting your degrees? Yeah. Well, so that's where, you know, I got, I got lucky and got these, uh, these fellowships that were able to, you know, pay for the schooling and, you know, tuition and all sort of stuff. Um, and so I didn't, I didn't have to do the traditional research or, or teaching that one usually has to do to be in like a grad school program. So this fellowship just allowed me to like, kind of think creatively and just do weird, wacky stuff outside the box. And fortunately my department and my major advisors and committee all really subscribe to the idea that, you know, a PhD really is a doctor of philosophy. And yeah, it has sort of certain connotations that like, you know, you're kind of an expert in your field, but really it's like, how do you think philosophically? How do you think outside the box? And how do you, how do you invent something um, from an academic approach? So they're just like, you know, do, do things that haven't been done before, do the weird and the wacky, you know, this travel program I, I developed became like really successful. Um, I partnered with the Florida Museum of Natural History, and we became their de facto travel program, um, much like how I work with World Wildlife Fund now. And it just like turned really successful. And you know, even amidst like what you know, 2008 financial crisis, we were growing like you know, 100% a year in terms of how many trips and how many travelers and how many programs and diversity and all that. So I mean, I, a big credit is that I. Um, got support from the faculty, support from the museum, support from the university to just do weird, wacky stuff, um, get in front of people and talk about travel. But then a big, the other big part is that um, I, I didn't have to have that, you know, whatever they, you know, 13 hours or 20 hours a week of grading papers and teaching intro biology classes. Um, so that allowed me to think outside the box, think more, think more philosophically and a little bit more inventively on, you know, how we can turn this idea into an actual degree uh, mm -hmm. and it is a degree now so you know it's kind of like <laughs> guinea pig ish <laughs> um but yeah it's like a, you can get a degree on ecotourism entomology now <laughs> <Who'd have thought? laughs> so were, were these trips ran through the university like were you almost having a micro business underneath the uh, your university like department or was this a whole separate business entity that you were also running and doing an experiment if, for lack of yeah. better words? So, I mean, for, by like terminology, it was a for-profit company. It wasn't like, I didn't have a bank account within university of Florida to draw from and That would have been a nightmare. Um, <laughs> so it was, it was, it was run as if, you know, a, a, a separate entity um, were then selling travel to the museum, to the university, to the alumni association. Um, it, it just, was a you know it was just me and my advisor basically and uh so it was it was small enough scale that we just had such an intimate relationship that you know and when i say for profit you know we 
we really did it, you know, from an educational standpoint, we really did it for like a, a, an experience standpoint. We did it as like a member perk for the university, for the museum. Um, so no, it wasn't like a subsidiary or anything like that, but because I was also a grad student, um, we were just super close. Mm. Okay. That makes, that makes total mm -hmm. sense. So then how did you branch onto the other continents? So how'd you start from going to like the monarch migration to everywhere? And where did that fit in to your bigger picture of what you were going for? So I always wanted to go to Madagascar and Papua New Guinea and Antarctica and Galapagos <laughs> Islands. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, a little bit of that, um, a little bit of like, you know, market research and, you know, where are the other museum travel companies going? I'm like, oh, they're going to um, Kenya. Okay, let's let's do a Kenya trip. There's obviously demand there. Um, and then we'd run trips and we'd ask our guests, like, where have you always wanted to go? And, you know, when you're, when you're a really small outfit, there's a, a heck of a lot of loyalty. Um, and it's, you know, it's hard to ac acquire new guests because, you know, you're an, sort of an unknown. But if you can work with your existing pool of clients, you know, you really can branch out from there. So it was just a lot of, you know, customer fidelity, basically. Um, and so we'd be on a Galapagos trip and one night at dinner, we'd be talking about Kenya and like people would be like, oh yeah, if you went to Kenya, I'd go to Kenya. And, you know, then on our 20 person Galapagos trip, six of them will go to Kenya. And then you just get another six people from somewhere else and boom, we got a Kenya trip together. Okay, that's cool. That's because that I wanted awesome. to go there. I was gonna I really say, wanted. <laughs> want to check off all the boxes. Yeah. But they're also logical places, you know, I mean, yeah. they're, they're not like, I mean, some of them are sort of obscure, but not, not all of them. <laughs> so then what was your biggest takeaway from uh, running take all away of these trips? Yeah. Oh, man. Like, what was the biggest, like, I mean, I know that I'm sure your dissertation and everything was pages, 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 pages long. But if you could give me like a summary, what was some of your biggest takeaways, especially from like the conservation travel? What did you find? Yeah. Uh, 593 pages to be exact. Jesus um, Christ. I know it's like, it's like a book. It's ridiculous. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know. Um, yeah. So the biggest takeaway, well, one of the biggest takeaways is I loved it. I want to do more of it, but really like the big, you know, profound sort of like saving the world takeaway is that, you know, it, it all gets distilled down into this. If you can add value to natural ecosystems, you demonstrate to local people, local stakeholders, people that may care or may not care about wildlife, that it's just economics. Like who, who cares if you love that butterfly? It, it doesn't really matter if you love giraffes. You're going to make more money. You're going to put more food on your family's table. You're going to be able to provide health care and education for your kids in a better way. And oftentimes, like many times better way, if you make some sacrifices um, protect this area, um, be involved in ecotourism, or at least just for, you know help not um, aid in the deterioration of the area um, by doing ecotourism versus whatever the the next best or next worst activity might be. Um, and so I was like, man, so I love it because it's so simple. Um, and as much as we may not like it, the world revolves around finances. You know, you, you have to have money to be able to put food on the table, or at least you have to have land to grow crops and then put food on the table. But, you know, you go to these places and, you know, I had the great fortune to go to a, a lot of different countries and you can't just march in there and say, hey, we really like this pretty blue butterfly. So, you know, don't cut those trees down. I know you need to get rice for your family, but we'd prefer if you didn't. Like, no, that's crazy. You you have to give them a better way. You got to get food on the table. But ecotourism is such a tangible and pretty easily adoptable way to say, we're going to get you a lot more rice, buddy. We're going to get you, you know, education and healthcare. Like all these things will come along by um, supporting this idea of ecotourism. And that was my big takeaway. So the more ecotourism, responsible travel, the more responsibly you can do it, the better. Let's do more of it. And let's do it in a bigger way. And let's and then there's like this other aspect, which was not, it was actually recognized pretty early on because of the member travel program. But the more, um, the more folks you can get on these trips with influence, whether they're an activist, whether they're a donor, whether they're part of a, a university newspaper, whether the university president or museum president, whatever, 
the more people like that you can get on trips, the more disproportionately positive impact you can have because they have circles that just mere storytelling will help protect the places. Um, or they might have the means to donate to the programs that are then further protecting the areas, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, I mean, a lot was realized by my very early travels and I just knew I, I, I just wanted to do more of it. That's awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. How did you go about making the right connections in these countries? These are probably foreign places you've never been to before. Mm -hmm. What strategies did you take to meet the right people to bring these foreigners essentially to these really epic places? Yeah. So um, for, for any sort of travel industry, you, you definitely have to have those local connections and you have to know, you know, you can't just march into a country and do it all yourself. There are some places where you can do a little bit more like, you know, in Mexico for the monarchs, I, I did a lot of that. You know, I would hire the bus company. I would hire, uh, I would book directly the hotels, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, most places, if you do that, you're going to get burned or you're just, or at least you're just not going to provide a quality experience. So, you know, you, you work with a, a local in-country partner or, or operator that um, is used to working with um, companies basically, you know, and you go in there and you fine tune it, but you rely on their expertise and their local knowledge. Um, so a lot of it is connections with researchers, a lot of it connections with my graduate school advisors, um, a lot of it with a little bit of research online or something like that, you know, through people to people connections, you can figure out, oh yeah, this is the guy I used for my Kenya safari or, you know, oh, these guys do really well in Costa Rica. Um, so a lot of it is just kind of word of mouth connections. Nowadays, you can probably do it online, but this is, um, it's not, it's not like the internet didn't exist. We're not talking about that long ago, but it wasn't, I mean, you know, every year that goes by, it, it exists more and more. Um, so yeah, a lot of, um, relying on my advisors, my contacts, my friends, my fellow researchers that knew something. And that was actually, you know, you ask about how to develop these other programs. That was a lot of it. You know, I couldn't just say, Hey, I want to start doing tours in Djibouti. You know, it's like, well, we don't know a contact there. It's like maybe a guest will say, Hey, you know, I went on a trip, with this other company company and here's here's the brochure and you can kind of like once you start reading this if you figure out who they work with or or how to go about getting it um but yeah no no one way but i will say you you have to start somewhere you, you got to have local contacts hmm. yeah that makes sense so i could just see i mean anybody listening to this maybe they were wondering that or how do you get to these places like what is the best strategy and I'm sure too, as the world becomes more connected in super rural places, which is exciting and at the same time a little scary, depending on the development road that everything takes and you know goes down. But so why did you not keep this starting to thrive business that you mm -hmm. do? Yeah, no, great great question. And now I mean it was a very pivotal moment. So um, yeah, I was, uh, nearing the end of my PhD and I, uh, I realized, okay, I could either, you know, try to take over this business, um, or start my own, or I could, uh, go out there and, you know, I, I of course knew about the Nat Geos and the, um, the Nat Habs and the, you know, fill in the blank, what all the different companies out there. I mean, we, they're known, you, you get the brochures and you see what they're doing. Like it was just something I did for like a decade. Um, and so I didn't own this company. My major advisor did. Um, and so I would have had to, you know, buy that. Um, and so it was either that start my own or join as I just kind of putting the feelers out there. And I reached out to a couple companies now have, uh, being one of them and just cold, cold email, cold call. I don't even know if I attached a CV. Um, I was like, Hey, so this is me. Like what's what's up? <laughs> what are you guys doing? Um, and NatHab had been one that I had um, looked up to for a long time, been reading their catalogs and knew a lot about their company. And uh, we made a connection, and they flew me out there, and um, I toured the office. This is back in 2013, um, and you know it was like what 25 people then. It was you know a fraction fraction of the size it is now. Um, and the big moment it all distilled down into this is that I saw what NatHab was doing with World Wildlife Fund, with conservation travel, with the places they were going that I had a lot of experience and a lot of love and a lot of um, interest in expanding programs there. And basically I said, okay, if I did my own thing, no matter how it was, I could, even if the best case scenario, 
Nat Hab is doing what I would like to be doing in 25 years. They're doing it today. And I was like, man, like there's something really powerful about instantly, you know, joining the big leagues and having a bigger platform to stand on, a bigger mountain to shout from, more opportunity, more capital to do weird, wacky things, more ability to take that risk on a country that you would have no business trying to start tourism in. But these guys, they can do that. That's what they want to do. So that that was really it. You know, it was just like, oh my God, they're they're doing what I want to like again, perfect world. Everything goes very well. In twenty years, I'd be doing what Nat had is doing, you know, today, back seven, eight years ago. And that convinced me. I was like, all right, let's give it a shot. Let's go big. And then of course, you know, one of the big things is they offered me this um I I will say it was like a liaison position between World Wildlife Fund and NatHab. And it was kind of like this sweet spot where it's like a lot of what I was doing before, but a lot of opportunity for growth. And, you know, all of a sudden I was operating this like VIP sector of one of the world's largest conservation organizations for one of the world's best ecotourism companies uh, with this nonprofit, this, you know, World Wildlife Fund that has like, you know, over a million members just in the world, uh, the U.S. alone. So like, man, this, this can lead to some cool things. And it has. You just saw greater impact. Your opportunity to have much greater impact immediately versus a maybe on a longer term scale. Exactly. You sacrifice the control. You sacrifice a bit of your own ability for personal vision and personal whatever um, for joining a team that maybe, you know, through your, <laughs> through your powers combined, you can do bigger, better things. And I, I, I absolutely think it played out that way. I, I think that's exactly how it went. Great. And continues so what, to go. Yeah. So what are some of the things that you do now? And that have just for anyone listening, it's called it's natural habitat adventures is the full name. Um, they are a fantastic company. I know I used to work for them too. And <laughs> you work really closely with court. Um, so why don't you just give some examples of some of the things that you've been able to accomplish through this role that you've now found yourself in? as you know, the director of conservation for this company, when a lot of travel companies don't even have a title like that, no one's in their whole organization that's focused just on conservation. So what is your role and what do you do? Now? Sure. Yeah. So um, it's, you know, it's, it's evolved just like anything, you know, when I, when I was hired, it's like, I don't even know if they really knew where to put me, but I kind of carved out my own niche. And uh, so now, you know, for, for many years now, I've been the director of sustainability and conservation and travel. And, you know, I do wear a number of other hats, but basically what that allows me to do is take a company that was already easily one of the greenest, you know, most sustainable travel companies out there and um, ensure that not only do they keep that reputation, but maybe, you know, go above and beyond. And this is where it's just, it's so fun and so inspiring to, um, you know, when you're with a su successful company, you c you can take that risk on weird, wacky things. You know, um, back in 2007, before my time, we became the world's first carbon neutral travel company. Um, we continue that legacy uh, in bigger and better ways. But then, you know, sort of in, in my time, in my era, we were able to r run the world's first zero waste adventure. Um, so being able to do weird, wacky stuff like that, you know, it's just, it's hard. It's hard to think of being able to do that with anything less than a company that's the size of the stature um, of a NADHAB. But, you know, <clears throat> those are very, very specific examples. It, it extends so much more beyond that to day-to-day -day things, what we're doing in the office, what we're doing on each and every trip to be sustainable. But it boils down to basically just, you know, being the the, the shepherd slash architect of, of sustainability and making sure our impact um is is a net positive one and that's you know it's one of the big critiques of travel is like well um you know aren't you having an impact in these places you go I'm like oh hell yeah we are i mean you you can't walk out the door without having an impact with anything you do but it's it's critical that you have a, a net positive impact you know for whatever carbon emissions it takes to get there even though we offset it um you know whatever impact you have in bringing western ideology into remote villages you have to have a better impact um, by being more sustainable and you know you're kind of you're you're leading this vanguard so to speak where um if you're like the the big player in the industry and every other company looks up to you in some way shape or form they kind of follow along in, in um not necessarily in your wake but yeah like in your vanguard you know you you do it together but we can kind of help lead the way 
so that that's like a big part of what I do, but you know, it's equally rewarding. I, I am an expedition leader or, you know, a guide with us. So I get to travel, you know, on about six to eight trips, sometimes even more each year uh, in all different regions, all different places in the planet. Um, and that's super rewarding because it, it connects the office in the field. Um, for me, it's something, you know, starting as a guide and an office person, it kind of keeps me connected to my, my interests and roles. Um, it helps me implement ecotourism in the field. You know, in, with a lot of these bigger companies, there is that disconnect. You know, you don't necessarily, the, the office folks aren't the field folks and vice versa. And that's just how it has to be. Um, I love whenever we can cross over as much as possible. And there's always a bit of crossover, but I feel like I'm kind of living that to, to you know, make sure <laughs> make sure everything's going the way I hope it is. Uh, and uh, being able to impart that wisdom, uh, you know, office wisdom in the field and vice versa, I think it helps a lot. And then uh, last but not, <clears throat> not least, I, I head what I would say is kind of like our VIP travel program within World Wildlife Fund. And so with any philanthropic organization, any NGO, you you have a donor, donor um, well, it's largely donor-based. You know, it might be, you know, partly grant-based, but we will offer a select set of trips each year to their biggest supporters um, as like a, another level into the ecosystems, into their work, into their under, understanding. And um, not only is it getting these people more educated and aware with what's going on in the field, but um, it's also helping to further fundraise. It's, it's making them even more supportive of the mission. And so these trips will often garner um, significant levels of support to let them you know, start new projects that they haven't even begun yet or support life, the life of certain projects for many more years, um, often in the, in the many millions of dollars, which is you know, super rewarding. So I feel like through this one position, this one title, I'm able to kind of have my hands in, in all facets of ecotourism, um, partly because I like it, partly because of that, you know, it allows me to make sure the engine's running smoothly, so to speak. But yeah, it's it's a, a, a real honor to be able to do all that stuff and do it at a big level. Um, I probably wouldn't have guessed I'd be at this point, you know, seven years ago, just finishing up grad school, but I'm super happy that I am. <laughs> yeah, just goes to show that you made the right decision because those right. big decisions can sometimes be the scariest. Like mm -hmm. I have this baby that I've pretty much grown from the ground and mm -hmm. have gotten quite a bit of success from it. So taking a big leap, moving to a different state, starting with a company where they don't even know where to put you. I mean, that's huge. And it obviously worked out, which is great. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I wanted to tag on from what you just said I think one of my biggest realizations working closely with you um, at Natural Habitat Adventures was that there isn't a stigma, that there shouldn't be a stigma against for profits in the conservation world. Because I came from the nonprofit sector, and there's always this I don't know, like for profits are the devil, pretty much, kind of just undertone of. You know, they the, all they want to do is get money. That's all. That's why would anybody be in conservation and call them and and, and have the for profit model? And I think that was one of the biggest values being there is. I think that I was able to help with you some of the biggest conservation goals ever. We were able to do underneath the umbrella because the business was ran so well and the impact was so strong that there was the, you know, financial um, backing, like you said, to do the world's first zero waste trip, to be completely carbon neutral in everything that we did. Like that's huge stuff. And you don't have to constantly ask people for money, you know, like you don't have to constantly be like donors, please give me money. And just that whole fundraising aspect it was nice to not have to rely on that stuff to make an impact in the world so i thought that was very powerful having been exposed to for profits i was like i'm doing more for conservation working at this company than i felt like my entire career before which i thought that was incredibly powerful for at least me <laughs> yeah there's this phrase the going world. around i've heard uh profit for purpose um it's kind of a, it's becoming a little bit of a buzzword or buzz phrase yeah, but i love that like it's really cool because you know yeah okay great you know being a nonprofit's fantastic and they do great work um but yeah it shouldn't 
be so polarized that like just because you're for profit you can't do um as much good i I mean i think that it really just comes down to like what what is your kind of like operational focus um and so for a lot of nonprofits, uh the focus might be grant writing and so you know they well obviously the focus is the work that they do but one one of like the underlying focuses is you know how do you how do you get the best grant writers or how do you find the best projects or how do you implement your projects in such a way that it makes your next grant that much more likely? Um, and no matter what, it, it tends to detract from the specifics of the work. Um, so, you know, for donor based organizations, you have to really focus on the donor um, for profit based organizations. You have to really focus on the profits, but what you do behind all that is the real work. And I think, yeah, you, you hit the nail on the head is that you you absolutely, well, I think both really kind of need one another in a way, especially if you're going to do the most good. So, you know, if you're, if you're like an ecosystem, you know, you can't just have the carnivores, you can't just have uh, the vegetarians, <laughs> the herbivores, you, you, you kind of, you can't just have the detritivores, you can't just have the omnivores, you can't just have the birds in the canopy and the birds in the ground. Like the more you can kind of get together, the more it all works together, as long as each has a, a known, predictable, consistent focus. If they flip flop all around, it's hard to predict. But, you know, so if you're for profits, um, you know, do a lot of good when they can but also are able to become bigger, have a bigger voice, um, be able to do more things, be able to hire better people, be able to give more conservation money or more money to conservation or do really interesting um, conservation messaging or um, yeah, what have you. And then the nonprofits do their thing. And then you have these other sort of hybrids in between. It's, it's, it's all about, um, you know, a heterogeneous ecosystem in business. Um, you know, the more, the more people, more missions, more styles you have, the better it's all going to work together. But th- maybe the thing, the takeaway from that is like, that's fine if they all exist, but for them to work together to build this ecosystem, they have to network. They have to come in contact with each other. They have to have those partnerships or collaborations or, or what have you. Um, so I think that's pretty key. Yeah, I love, <laughs> I love all the science analogies it just makes me happy <laughs> that was so good i really enjoyed that <laughs> so to, to shift a little bit um you are a phenomenal photographer that is definitely one of the things that you are insanely good at is wildlife photography so where in your story did wildlife photography come into play because you're a scientist but you're a really good photographer so how did that happen yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, I, yeah, I just, I just like it. Um, it's really the gist. Uh, my first camera was, you know, one of the very early point and shoots, um, right before that Belize trip I was talking about, it was, you know, saved up my, uh, my whole life savings at that point for a little three megapixel camera. Um, didn't know if I was going to like it, but ended up really enjoying it. Like it was, it was kind of a way, um, to make me look at things I might otherwise pass up you know I told you I had all this time in the rainforest by myself and you know I wasn't the kind of kid to travel and do that sort of stuff so I had to force force myself to look at things differently and change the pace of my life and I think photography was a really big part of that um and really it just it started with this you know something that would uh you know our cell phones 10 years ago were way better than this camera like that's just the it's so I started with that but then got a better point and shoot and then a better point and shoot and just kind of graduated from one camera to another throughout the years. And I guess what I've sort of r- realized is that photography, well, of course, photography is a great way to um, uh, tempt people into travel. So it was a big part of you know the business. It was a big part of getting people to go on trips. Uh, but it can be a really big force for good. Not only do you get people that may not otherwise want to sit and just, just observe nature, you get them on trips, you get them part of this ecotourism infrastructure, um, but you also have a way of preserving this stuff and showcasing it and tempting more people and getting more people to to care about these things, to, to give a shit about a panda or a pangolin or a butterfly. Um, you know, there's a, there's a, a saying that you you cannot save what you do not love and you cannot love what you do not know. And so I think you, you had you can get people to know stuff by being on a trip. Great. Come on, let's go on a trip. But you know, 
not everybody's going to be able to go to Kenya or go to the rainforest of Borneo. So you get them to know it, maybe just a fraction, but you get them to know a little bit better by seeing it via photos or videos or social media. And I think that does play an incremental part in helping save the species because people know a little bit better. They might love it a little bit and therefore save it a little bit um, just by the, the, the way that all works. But you do that a million times over when people see these photos and videos or whatever. And I think it, it plays a big part in the conservation of whatever you're showcasing, uh, one animal or one ecosystem. Nice. Talk about your podcast. You actually have a podcast about this. Yeah, yeah. So I do. Um, it, it's called the Wild Photographer Podcast. Um, started it about a year ago, like last, I think, early, late. I don't know. When was it? Like late December, early January, something like that. Maybe a little bit later. Um, and the idea is it's going to provide nature photography instruction uh, to those interested um, from ultra novice to advanced, everything in between. Um, it might talk about, you know, whether to shoot JPEG versus raw photos, or it might talk about how to get a perfect sunset shot, um, or my five favorite ways to photograph elephants. You know, it's, the idea is just like a bunch of topics. And my hope, and, and obviously COVID has, has sort of changed this, but my hope was that people would um, download, you know, a bunch of episodes before they take a big international, international flight and just listen to these little, you know, 20 minute snippets of, you know, five um, creative uh, lesser known ways to photograph Galapagos giant tortoises or whatever, you know, when they're on a plane, they can't watch a YouTube video. Um, it's, uh, you know, when travel resumes, I think it's going to fulfill that purpose, but I think it, it's had an equally good impact, you know, in a weird way and that people are, they're just wanting to learn. They're using this time to maybe uh, immerse themselves in the world of travel, even if they're not traveling. And yeah, hopefully it's a little outlet for people wanting to get a jump start on, you know, when they are headed over to Africa, you know, how are they going to, photograph that African sunset of the Serengeti, et cetera, et cetera. So I like it. And then you have a little Instagram page uh, with the, the wild photographer. I think it's the dot wild dot photographer. Um, and yeah, you know, it's just a great way to sort of learn by example, learn via my, you know, my own learning. I've, I've never done this as like an educational or like, you know, I haven't gotten to school for it. There's a lot of just school of hard knocks, so to speak with learning by trial and error. Um, and yeah, it's it's been a long, fun journey in photography and eager to share it with folks that want to hear me yap about it. <laughs> and what's really fun about this time is one of the only things that we can do is just go outside in nature, go to a local park, go to anything. And having a resource like your podcast is great because you can you can practice. So before, you know, travel opens back up, it was just going to the world is going to open back up. We're going to figure everything out. People can go listen to your episode, whatever the tip might be, and then practice somewhere. You want to practice how to take a sunset shot? We'll go. We all have a sunset. That is something we can all take practice on of photographing. We might not be able to photograph elephants right now, but I mean, maybe if your local zoo's open, then maybe sunset elephant shot over there. Sure exhibit no, i mean you're totally right i mean and you know the only reason i'm a good photographer is because of practice and fortunately i get to practice in the field which is super fun but yeah if you could i mean just the more time you put into photography the better you're going to be you're going to know your camera more you're going to know what that little dial does you're going to be quicker to the punch when you get that epic shot of something that you never expected um, so even if it might seem boring um, which hopefully it's not hopefully you can take some you know fun photos of your uh, passionate about but yeah just get out there and practice 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 that's awesome maybe i'll have to have you back later on to give some of your yeah, biggest sure. yeah, yeah, yeah i'd be happy to <laughs> <laughs> that would be so fun maybe we should do a live one we should go out in nature and actually like do oh, it like could. in person that would be so fun hey you call the once shots i'll be live. there once I'll we're live. yeah right right we'll get there, we'll get there. um next so i recently heard so I had a conversation with um, Haley Hawkins recently, and she works for the Endangered Species Coalition, and she brought up some pretty disturbing statistics about the Western monarch population. I, since you are the monarch guy, <laughs> I would really love if you could kind of shed some light on what's going on with monarchs, what is going on with that particular population, and what's next? What should we know and what should we do? 
Yeah, so monarchs. Um, so in short, you know, the, the North American monarch uh, has an Eastern and a Western population. They're they're found worldwide. They're one of the only like cosmopolitan species of butterflies. They're not found in Africa. They're not found in Antarctica, but they're found everywhere else. Um, so they're never really going to be considered an endangered species, um, unfortunately. Uh, maybe they will, but it's by definition they're going to be around. Like it's not like they have a restricted range. But their migration may be endangered. Well, it's de it's definitely endangered, but it could be considered endangered um, because there are some big risk factors that, like, from one year to the other, could just completely cause total havoc on their on their population. So anyway, North America has the biggest population of monarchs. The eastern is everything east of the Rocky Mountains. The western is everything west of the Rocky Mountains. That's slightly oversimplified because you get some weird stuff going on in Arizona. You don't really get migrations happening in southern Florida. They just stay there year round. When you think of like why anything migrates, it's because it runs out of food or it, it, its conditions are not <laughs> suitable for life. Um, they can deal with most of the year in those places. But let's just oversimplify it and say eastern and western. Um, th they're both in kind of bad condition. Um, the western doesn't get as much press because it's it's much smaller. Um, they essentially migrate to like the Monterey Bay area. Um, they roost on eucalyptus trees, which is sort of weird because they're an introduced species to begin with. Um, and they roost in relatively small aggregations. And I, I think like at any, any given year, they're in like 25 different spots and they're, they're in like the hundreds or thousands per spot. So the, it's super cool, but there's not a lot of like big scale international tourism. Um, even domestic tourism is not super significant. The eastern population we're talking about in the hundreds of millions of butterflies, and at one time it was thought to be like a couple billion. Um, and every year over the course of the North American winter, these two populations uh, migrate. Again, western goes to the sort of uh, slightly cool but not freezing areas of Monterey Bay. The big migration we all hear about goes from the east coast of the U.S. or sorry, not east coast, but all eastern, you know, Great Plains, Nebraska. Um, Great Lakes, New York, Maine, Southern Canada, um, all the way down to Mexico. Um, and they roost there for about five months. The California one's only like a couple months of, of hibernation or, you know, quasi hibernation. <clears throat> but the risk factors, you know, they're, they're kind of similar. Um, the biggest thing is just loss of habitat, you know, and what does that mean? That's a big catch all for a lot of the biodiversity crisis and a lot of just general conservation issues, habitat loss. And usually that means that we humans have, have mowed over where they like to live or where their food source is. Um, and when I say mowed over, you know, it's like it's development. It's, it's a new house. It's it's agriculture. It's um, it's uh, pollution from a stream. It just, you know, it, their habitat has been lost for some reason. Um, and so California, because it's a smaller population, they have less adaptability. Like they just can't deal with it as much. And so, gosh, every year, I mean, there's there's some pretty – bad numbers coming out about that population and you know i i i don't follow it anywhere near as closely as the eastern population but i'd imagine people are pretty alarmed over it because you know when when you were at thousands to begin with and every year you you look at like 86 percent declines over you know the course of one year to one year and that's going to whittle down to a certain amount that it just it, it doesn't it can't handle itself um, the good thing about monarchs is that, you know, every female lays uh, or at least has the ability to lay about 400 eggs over the course of her lifetime. So, I mean, if, if you do the math, if, if most of those eggs survive, they can they can build up pretty massively, like they can rebound quickly. And I've seen that year after year for the eastern population. You know, you you hear about this catastrophic loss down in Mexico because of freak snowstorm or because of illegal logging. Um, and then the next year they rebound. Or they go the other way I and mean, they big loss, but they're kind of always going up and down. But you know, there's always a point at which it's really hard to to come back from. Um, so yeah, habitat loss is always a big concern. You've got pesticides that might drift onto their host plants, milkweed plants. Is you know, it, it could um, could poison them, for lack of a better word. Um, a big part of habitat loss is not having their milkweed plants as available as they once were. This is a big thing we see with all monarchs, but particularly the Eastern ones is that a lot of the milkweed used to grow in these big prairies and big fields. And even as agriculture came into the Midwest, 
milkweed actually did pretty well because the farmers would transform the prairie. Um, they'd, you know, essentially convert it to ag fields, but then there'd be big margins, big roadways or big fallow fields or where milkweed is, a, it's just a weed. It grows super easily would grow and flourish and the monarchs would expand and, and do well. And that, <clears throat> that kind of leads to another semi interesting part of it is, you know, I mean, I want monarchs to survive. Obviously I'm kind of fanatical about it, but we also have to realize that in the last, you know, 20,000 years or whatever that they've kind of been around North America ever since the glaciers receded, most likely they are at a semi anomalous number, you know, like it, they, they may not have always been this numerous in North America. So it's not like we can say, oh man, we humans were so terrible because, you know, these monarchs have been doing their thing for millions of years and we just come in and ruin it all. What's well, like, well, we don't know that, you know. Um, what we do know is we love monarchs. They're they're um, surveyed and easily the most recognizable butterfly in the U.S., in North America, in the world. Their migration is one of the most spectacular things you'll ever see. Um, they generate a lot of income for Mexico, especially in these rural communities of, of central Mexico. Um, and it's not going to take much to save them. It's just going to take some awareness. It's just going to take knowing how to do it right. Um, it's going to take some people that want to pay for it, whether it's the farmers or whether it's people that are creating these really interesting like escrows and subsidies to pay farmers to 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 plant milkweed. Um, and, you know, we kind of we want to save what we love. You know, we, we want to you know, we, we have to pay for this sort of stuff. Um, so it's less of this philosophical thing that like, oh, we we are just, you know, the worst critters in the planet because we've just decimated this thing that's been on here since earth began no we should save it because it's beautiful and we love it and science has figured out a way to save it um so it, i don't know like it's kind of like a weird transition to end there but i think it is important to know that we shouldn't save this stuff just because it's the right thing to do we should save it because we all look around the room literally and metaphorically and say yeah this this stuff is cool like why would we not want to put a little bit of effort? Why would we not want to sprinkle a few milkweed seeds in the garden? Why would we not want to, you know, when, when the vote comes up or when we talk to a congressperson and say, oh, yeah, no, I think I think you should be in support of monarchs um, because they're just they're just really cool. And I think that life would uh, kind of be a little a little shitty if they weren't around. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, you are the monarch. Are you even have a book, right? About monarchs. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. So I've been guiding down there for close to two decades. And every time I'm down there, I take a lot of photos uh, and, you know, thousands, hundreds of thousands of photos kind of documenting the last couple of decades of what the, the overwintering, like the hibernation time period looks like with these almost billions, you know, these hundreds of millions of butterflies around. And so, yeah, I published this book. It's like 160 pages. It's kind of sort of like a coffee table book, but also um, uh, some scientific information but told in a, in a really friendly way you know i have like some photos of what they're doing aggregating on the trees and we'll talk about like oh yeah it's this species of tree because of this and this is how they know when to take flight and where to go and how they navigate etc cetera, etc cetera. so i like it a lot and and maybe maybe others will too <laughs> so far so and good where where is it at it's on amazon right now amazon? um so awesome. yeah yeah and you know the, the other reason i, I wrote it is because I've been looking on Amazon um, for years and, you know, there are a lot of like kids books on the monarch and, you know, the, the cute little caterpillar like animation or, you know, cartoon books, but there's not really any um, really cool photo books on like capturing mm -hmm. the, the real beauty and spectacle that is the monarch migration. Um, so you'll see there's a, you know, you go on Amazon and Google monarch migration book and you probably won't see it on the first page, but if you do it with my name, I guarantee it's the first thing to come up. I think it's just called the, uh, um, the monarch migration, a journey through the monarch butterflies winter home. It's all about what they're doing in Mexico. Um, I could write a whole other book on what they're doing in the U S but it's all about that, that overwintering period, which is, is truly like the, I think it's the most beautiful, magical part of their, their yearly cycle. Yeah. I definitely want to get down there. Yeah. I, it's amazing. <laughs> I don't even know it was a thing. Like that's the beautiful part about just being exposed to these natural phenomena. You're like, I don't even know I needed to see that, but I need to see that now. It's and gotta be on every, yeah, every nature person's list. I mean, it is unreal. Um, but you know, I, gosh, 
do it sooner than later. I mean, I, I, I don't think we're going to lose a migration, uh, certainly not the, the Mexican one. But, you know, as we talk about climate change, the butterflies can only go so high in the mountain to, to avoid rising temperatures. So, yeah, I mean, I would say get down there sooner than later. Um, you know, I, I don't think we're going to lose a migration. I think it's going to be a thing that's down there, especially the, the Mexican migration. The, the, the California one, of course, because it's smaller, um, it could fragment more. It could be sort of dangerous or, you know, it, more vulnerable. Um, but nevertheless, you know, as the climate warms, um, these monarchs go to very specific mountains that they can move up and down throughout the season to buffer for seasonal temperature changes. And they're already at the tops of these mountains. So if it warms up too much and they have to cool down more to gain altitude and cool down, they're already at the tops. You know, there's no more mountain to go to. So climate change could play a, a really significant role. Um, you know, there's, there's uh, fragmentation and cutting of the forest for agriculture. Fortunately, that has that was historically one of the bigger problems, but that's actually uh, been curtailed a lot via ecotourism. So it's a really positive thing there. Um, there's loss of habitat in the U.S., which is very dangerous as well. You know, like I talked about those those milkweed species. But you know, I think, um, yeah, I, I I think it's going to last for a good long while. But if as a naturalist, as a nature lover, get, definitely get down sooner than later because we can't say anything's for sure for sure or for certain. And it's like it's just it's that spectacular. You got to go see it. <laughs> Absolutely. And I would definitely consider you an expert in this field for many reasons. I'm trying to think of the best way to say this. Why do you think, or maybe from your just expertise and, and know-how in the field, why do you think we're not further along in conservation? Why is there still such a battle to mm, like just like in the big picture, like the big picture conservation. Yeah, big picture. I mean, especially <clears throat> in the U.S. Like, what from your years in the in the field? Why are we not further along? Uh, I'm I'm gonna say something you're probably not expecting. I I think that we're doing a lot better than we think. Um, I think the real reason is we're becoming more and more aware and more and more knowledgeable about how bad we got. Um, I think that, you know, the, the one cool thing I'll say about conservation these days is I think that regardless of, you know, current policies or new policies or current concerns or whatever, um, I think that uh, we can say there are more people on the planet with more ideas, better ideas than ever, like just straight numbers, more people on the planet than ever before that care about the environment. More people that care a little bit, more people that care deeply. I think it's 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 swinging in that direction. Um, a couple of things that are bad is that we have set ourselves up in this trajectory probably for the last, well, I mean, really for the last 13,000 years, but probably mostly for the last like 100, 150 years, and even more so in the last 60 years. It's, you know, we had the Industrial Revolution, we've got increased population, we we had, you know, this kind of golden era in like the 50s and 60s where we just wanted to produce and have a better income and better lives and develop world and people get richer at all costs and all expenses, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I think, you know, once those decisions have been made, if you were to like think in a weird sci-fi movie, you know, if if no other things had played out, like where would we be in 100 years from then, the, the deed was done. Once we made those decisions, like the world was going to look a certain way, but I think we, you know, we, we've gotten woke to the planet. Um, we've figured things out because the pe more people care, more people are getting out um, in nature, more people realize how fragile, how precious, how beautiful it is. And so we, we are, we're improving at a very positive rate. The problem is, is that we made decisions from generations that might not even be alive anymore that set us downhill. So like, our, our brakes are, you know, it's like, it's hard to figure out, like, are we playing the brakes? Are we going back uphill? Are we, and it's all metaphorical, of course, but the gist is, is that I think um, we are pretty far along. I think that it might be difficult to think we could instantly improve. Like I, when you say like, why aren't we further along? It's like, I, I think because we did so much damage and we're now learning how much we've done. Um, yeah, we just didn't know it. 
and we're learning it. And now, of course, you can you can look at a lot of things like you know various laws or whatever that have been reversed, or you know how we're we're dealing with or not dealing with the EPA, how we're opening Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, and like th- those are bad things. Like we shouldn't be doing those. We should be trying to improve. Um, but I really think it's it's stuff that's happened decades ago, and um, the world, what what progress we've made in the last few decades, I think is actually pretty notable you know like we we've done some good things um so that's the big like whoa didn't think he was gonna say that like i you know i i thought we thanks were for saying that it. yeah yeah i mean we're things are <laughs> they're not good but like there's a lot to be thankful for like i'm reading this great book right now called factfulness which i recommend for anyone out there i mean mm-hmm. honestly like it should be required reading um and one of the major points he makes is that um Things can be, oh, what does he say? Things can be bad, but getting better at the same time. Um, and it's like oversimplification, but it's like you you can, they might not be perfect, but they might be going the right direction. You got to be thankful for that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think you know, every generation that goes by, things are definitely beginning better. We just have to stall the deterioration as much as possible because if if we could just say okay okay all the bad stuff we've ever done halts tomorrow and like our trajectory of of care and wisdom and um proactiveness and environmentalism if that were to still go we'd we'd be sitting pretty in 50 years but it's that we're still on this like this mine cart is just descending deeper because it's like a heavy cart that we put on this earth with with a lot of feedback cycles and whatnot um it, it's hard. You can't pause that. So you can be getting better and also be bad at the same time. <laughs> mm-hmm. No, that's really good. I think that's a very insightful perspective that, and that's just like a really good book. That's it's so on my alley. It's so good. You've got to read. <laughs> it's actually like a really good breath of fresh air. Um, mm, it's it's like called those. Um, Factfulness, 10 Reasons Why We're Wrong About the World and Why Things Are better than you think and mm. it's like really inspirational now i'm not like sugarcoating anything like we all know oh, no. you know people listening to this you're probably on the same page like we're we're in a bit of a triage situation um but i like that you know if we look at the long game we're doing a lot of stuff right not enough <laughs> there's always but you know you can always do more but um I also, you know, half the reason I'm saying this is because I think that the way to inspire and encourage people is by having hope, not the other way around. Yes. And, you know, I think it's very, very easy to give up mm-hmm. on things. You say, yeah, we're too far along, you know, you know, go, go just ride out this storm <laughs> and yeah. go down with the ship. Like, no, 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 it's things, it's possible for things to get better. That, that's great. Thanks for that. <laughs> very good perspective. I love it. It's right up my alley. Mm-hmm. So for you, this is more of like a personal question, I guess. Um, What would you define as success for you? And when do you feel like you will have achieved it? Oh, man. Um, So there's a small private island in Tahiti I have my eye on. Um, It's called Cortopia. It doesn't exist yet. No, I'm kidding. Uh, (laughs) I don't know. I mean, that guy, Lee. That's honestly, okay. man, I've been like, you know, that's like something you grapple with. Like that's, I man, I, um, I'd say I have been successful. I'd say if you rest in your laurels, then you might as well hang it up. Um, I'd say you got to have fun and you got to be inspired and be uh, impassioned by what you're doing or else you're never going to be good at it and you're never going to inspire the next generation or the people that you talk to. So you, you got to have this like this big mix of things. But yeah, I mean this idea of like ultimate success. Like I, I think if you, if you have the mindset that such is even achievable, you, you might not be on that path to, to even get there. You know what I mean? Like I think the most motivated, uh, like objectively successful people are those that like never quit. Like there's just always something more to do. There's something more to learn. There's something more to explore. There's something more to, to figure out. There's something, there's more people to inspire. So, um, yeah, I think the only, you know, like, yeah, that's, it's, it's a, such a deep, it's a hard question. question. Um, I, 
I think I will always be successful and I'll never be done. Boom. That, 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 that's the answer really. It's like, you know, I think, I think, yeah, I've, I've, I've been doing it. I've done it, but like, it's never, it's not done. It's like you, um, it's cause it's like, it's the, it's the hunger that gets you there in the first place that I think mm-hmm. propels you all the way, you know, up the mountain or down the mountain, whatever metaphor you want to use. <laughs> yeah. It's like one of those questions that you go on like a 10 mile hike and you contemplate for a long time. Like what is success to me? And everybody's definition is different, which mm-hmm. I really love. Success isn't necessarily the dollars in your account. You know, it's it's a lot of different things. No, so I would argue really the happen. I would argue that probably the biological definition of success is leaving a legacy. Um, and I have a paper, well, not I say paper, a blog that I wrote um, on my website. You can read. And I think it's kind of like weird and funny. I just I wrote it at a truck stop before guiding um, a canyon trip one time. That's awesome. But basically, it's the idea that um, you know, if you've ever read any of like Richard Dawkins stuff, like Selfish Gene or River Out of Eden, you know, you know that like it's you know it's our genetics that flow like a river through time, and I think that our genes are basically telling us what to do. You know, in a weird kind of like physiological, biological sort of way. But I think that you know what we're really trying to do. Um, is live forever. I think our genes are trying to live forever through the population. I think they kind of tell us to do, <laughs> do that. I'm probably probably going down a weird, deep, dark rabbit hole now. No, keep but, going. You're a scientist. But <laughs> I know I, where you're going. I think that you know we're trying to live forever. We haven't figured out to do how to do so. And so there's a couple ways we can do do that. And I think it boils down to leaving a legacy. And that might be you know having kids that keeps your genes going through the population, or it might be having your name on a university football stadium that keeps your name alive forever. Um, so I think that like, if we're really trying to think about like what maybe some underlying motivations for a lot of people are, it's this idea of leaving this legacy that you will never, you'll live forever. you like, you'll always be relevant. You'll always be part of it. And I actually think that's a big motivation for a quest for stardom and fame. I think it's a big motivation for why people uh, do what they do. Uh, I think it's a big motivation for social media. Everybody's trying to get their 15 minutes because they're trying to stay relevant. They're trying to stay alive. They're trying to make a name for themselves that will last as long as possible. Um, hard to do, but anyway, so two di- very different answers. I think that might be like this weird underlying thing, um, but yeah, that's where I go back to like, man, don't think too much about it. Be happy, have a purpose, um, be prideful, get the job done have fun stories to tell, enjoy it. So what legacy are you leaving? What, what's your legacy you want to leave? Whew, I don't know. Maybe like inventing like a really good infomercial product, like something <laughs> like scratches your back, but also cleans your glasses. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> no, I know. It's like, so I, I thought of this and like, I went down this again, like when I was writing this and thinking, I still think about it. It's like, I, I, I truly believe that's the thing. But like, I don't want to think about it too much. I kind of want it to be innate. I kind of want to just still go through every day. And so I think if you if you consume yourself too much with it, you know, I don't think our genes are right. I don't think our genes really care about our, our happiness necessarily. Um, so yeah, I try not to listen to that instinct too much. But I, I do believe if you start to distill a lot of major decisions and a lot of the quest for power and a lot of quest to be a famous football player or be president or be, you know, the next fortune 500 CEO. I think it's using your existing skill set to try to make yourself famous, to try to, to leave that legacy. Um, so yeah, I'm going with like back scratcher eyeglass cleaner. I think that's, it's a winner. Well, you're so innovative. I will totally invest in your back scratcher, mm-hmm. my glass cleaner. Oh, that's hilarious. That's great. Awesome. Yeah. And so is there any like, last minute questions that I didn't ask? That you mm-hmm. really want to talk about? So the chickens have large talons. <laughs> no. Um... Oh, God, Court. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, you know, that's. Kind of said my piece. You, you heard the life journey. You heard um, my weird hippy dippy rant on legacy. Um, you you know most of me by now. Yeah. You're, you're like bugs. <laughs> That's it. 
What is your final ask of anybody listening? What's oh, one thing man. if you could get everyone listening to do or, or think about, what would that be? Yeah. So kind of like my, my first answer, maybe I'll think of something better in a second, but like when, when I think of conservation um, and I think of like how to save the world and all that sort of stuff, it's like, no, this, this will be my go, my, my answer. Like, don't, yeah, don't wait for the next one. This is it. This is final answer. Um, I, but it's two part. <laughs> I like it. So do whatever you do best and do it for conservation. So, you know, if, if you want to be a conservation, maybe, maybe, you know, maybe you're listening to this because you want to learn how to like for conservation, hopefully not. But like, if you want to be a conservationist, do whatever you do best. If you're a great writer, do it do writing. If you're a great photographer, do that. If you're a great guy, do that. If you're a great activist, go do that. Go protest. Go write your congressperson. If you're a great social media poster, do compelling content on social media. Like Everybody's good at something. If you're a great philanthropist, if you're a great business person that maybe has the capital to donate, like that's great. Everybody's got something they can do. But then do it and think about, like, well, how do I apply this to conservation? And that's probably going to be how you individually are going to be most successful, most powerful, and do the most good for conservation is by doing something you're already really really good at otherwise you're you know like the whole idea of like everybody should give as much money as i can like that that's maybe not the most impactful way like think of like think beyond that and then the other bigger picture thing is i think if there's one way we can all flip the switch on conservation and like i said i think you know there's a lot of reasons for optimism but you know we we do need more is we need to create a culture of sustainability and this is why when I hear of, you know, the whole plastic straw initiative that swept throughout the U.S. and the world um, a couple of years ago to, to basically get, you know, to, to straw shame and to get straws out. I, I love it. I think it's great. Um, I also know that plastic straws account for like 0.003% of plastics in the world. So it is very much a drop in the bucket. Like it's, it doesn't solve the ocean's plastic problem. But it does in a way because it gets people thinking about it. And what was so miraculous about that initiative is that it it hit the right points and it hit the right uh, thought provoking messaging and it hit something that's doable and it hit something that was interesting to do and to tell and to to instigate others to follow and it changed the culture on something. And I think what we need to do is think about that in the broad picture is that you know if, if everybody can be thinking of conservation in a more cultural sense, we're going to have bigger and better innovations all the time. If we stop thinking about conservation, it's not part of our culture. And our culture is just to, you know, burn excessive oil and gas and to mine to get more gold and copper and materials and to, you know, constantly buy this and replace that and have bigger this and more of this. Like it's, it's kind of, it's going to be hard to reverse that. So I don't have the answer of how to create culture of sustainability, culture of conservation. But I do know that there, there are places in the world that I've visited where there is that. And the best example I've found is is Costa Rica. Um, Costa Rica very much has a culture of conservation where like the vast, vast majority of people, like 90% think about conservation. They're always thinking about like, well, how can we be less waste? How can we use less carbon? How can we do this and that? How how can we, and so they're, they're innovating and they have these incredible, incredible mandates and incredible goals to like be a carbon neutral company a country by a certain date. I don't I don't know exactly when, but like that's the kind of level they're thinking. And so when everybody kind of buys in this culture of conservation, you can do so much bigger things. Um, and it really just comes down to the basic idea of being a little bit more fluent in the conversation of conservation. I'm using a lot of like <laughs> conversation, conservation words here. But the idea is if you can get more time to think about it if you can talk more about it if it becomes normal to not get a straw it can become normal to not use a plastic spork it can be normal to choose a slightly more efficient fuel it can be more normal to not always buy the latest and greatest of everything and it's like this baby step to big step to like you know moon landing step that we can ultimately do but it's not going to happen unless these little incremental victories are talked about and that's where I think, you know, the straw example is such a great example for how we, we really can change the culture of our world um, in relatively little time. It just has to be done and it takes everybody, most people. No, thank you for that. Those that were really long, great. parting words. <laughs> no, that was good. No, that was really good. 
And if anybody wants to connect with you, what's the best way for them? Um, so gosh, yeah, I'm, I'm sort of active on online and whatnot. I do have a website, just courtwhalen.com. Probably the best way to get a hold of me is to email me. Um, it's court at courtwhalen.com. I'm also active on Instagram, court underscore Whalen. I'm assuming the spelling of my name will probably be somewhere within this podcast, but um, <laughs> okay, I'll make all the same it. spelling. Um, and yeah, yeah, and I'm sure you're probably going to have uh, a way for people to reach out to you and you know how to get old me too. So yeah, I'd love to continue the conversation with anybody out there. Awesome. Well, this is great, Court. Thank you so much. We'll have to do another one for sure and go on to the next one. Absolutely. Looking forward to it. Well, thanks everybody for listening out there. And thanks you, Brooke, for uh, organizing all this. Hey, thanks again for listening to this episode of Rewildology. If you like what you heard, hit that subscribe button to never miss a future episode. Do you have a cool environmental organization, travel story, or research that you'd like to share? Let me know at rewildology.com. Until next time, friends, together we will rewild the planet.